Welcome to this free immigration help channel. Today I will show you how to apply for your travel document. And yes, in front of me there is a page for I-131 that is open on the official US Citizenship and Immigration Services website USCIS.gov. All the links can be found in the description below. Now I have already made a video like this quite a while ago with the step-by-step -step instructions on how to submit your application for the travel document but ever since then there was an actually an update in uh, 2022 for the form so I wanted to make an updated video. Before we begin though I wanted to start by saying that I am not an immigration attorney this is not a legal advice all of the information that provided in on this channel in my videos are directly from USAS website and can be found on it. I recommend checking it out just in case if there is an update since I've made this video. Okay, so let's start from the very beginning. I'm going to take us to the home page so that you know your way around the website and how to find that application. This is how the home page of USAS looks. So let's start by finding the form I-131. So we will go into the forms at the very top navigation menu right here. I'm going to click on forms. You will have a few options, but we're going to click on all forms. And that will give us, yes, you guessed it right, all forms. So we're going to scroll down past all of the stuff. You can also alternatively use this search bar right here and just type in whatever you're looking for. But we're going to scroll down to I-131, here it is, application for travel document. Now, unfortunately, USAS did not implement the online application for it just yet. Would be nice, I have to say, but at this time, you can only apply for the travel document using the paper application. So, we're gonna scroll down past all of these alerts I will leave it up to you. If you want to read through through them, I definitely recommend, but we're not going to concentrate on any of this. Otherwise, it will take a very, very long time to make this video. But two documents that uh, I obviously you're going to need uh, in order to complete this application will be right here in PDF format. I'll put the links, separate links in the description below, so it's easier for you to navigate to them. But there is a form I-131, which we will open in a separate tab. And there's also instructions for the form I-131. Now, before even starting the application, which is this form right here, we will go, I know it might look a little bit uh, intimidating if you've never filled out yourself any kind of immigration forms, but don't worry, it's very, very straightforward. I will go through it step by step in this video. But before even looking at this uh, application, I definitely recommend you reading through the instructions. Now, the instructions will pretty much do kind of exactly the same thing that I will do in this video and walk you through every step. In addition, they will tell you what kind of requirements there are, what kind of additional documents you need to provide, where to file the fees and all of that information. There's quite a few pages here to be specific, 17 of those pages, but on your own time, I definitely recommend you reading through it and when you're filling out your application, keeping it open. Just in case if you need something to look into, it's probably the answer is gonna be right there. So let's get back to the page, the main page for uh, I-131. I wanted to show you a few other things before we dive into filling out the actual application. Uh, if you scroll down, all the way down, uh, there are a few things that uh, I wanted to point out. First of all, the edition date. As of making this video right now, the edition date for the application is 10-31-22. So it's October 31st, 2022. That was the most recent update. Uh, USAS regularly changes and updates the application. So make sure to kind of verify the edition date. For example, if I made this video, you know, if, as of today, January 27, 2023, if you're watching it three, four months down the road and there's another update, just so that you, you know, when you're looking through the application, you don't really have any kind of confusion and, you know, it's okay, this is different from what he's showing me, what's going on, so you kind of understand. USAS, they update stuff regularly. Now, in the next step, you will find where to file your paper application. Uh, we will go through the uh, addresses later once we're done filling out the actual application. There's also the filing fee, which is the fee that you have to pay for the application in order to be processed. Now, you, you will find 
it's based on age, based on type of the application. There are quite a few ones, but again, depending on which one, which situation works for you, if you're applying for advanced parole, for example, there will be different fees on based on which uh, categories that you're applying for that. But again, we kind of will go through a few of them once we are filling out the application. Most of the times though, you probably are expecting to pay $135 if you're applying for the refugee travel document. And if you're applying for a regular advanced parole document, uh, such as the application types D, E and F, again, we'll talk about that a little bit later, expect to pay pay $575 as that is as of today. Again, the fees are consistently being updated. All right, so we're gonna close these tabs. There's a checklist for required initial evidence that you will have to provide with your paper application. Uh, again, we will go through this briefly um, when we are done filling out the actual application. There's some filing tips. Again, open it up. Check it out. Special instructions rarely apply to, you know, here and there, but again, check it out. And there are some related links. So let's get into our application and start filling it out. Now, in uh, this example, I will be using our John Doe, who is from, uh, he's usually from Brazil, uh, from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And uh, he's a refugee. He, he has the status of a refugee. He came here as a refugee to the United States. Honestly, I don't even know if you can come as a refugee from Brazil, but this is just an example for example purposes so that I'm kind of filling out as we go along. So as you can see, you're not, it's, it's clearly says, says here, start here. So you're leaving everything up here blank. This is only for uh, immigration officer purposes for them to use that. So we'll start with a family name. Obviously, that's the last name and it's going to be Doe. Given name, John. All right. And then the middle name he does not have. And that's where I wanted to introduce something. If you haven't watched any of my videos, whenever it comes to the paper applications, you don't want to leave any blank spaces. This is very, very important. So for example, if in our case, John Doe does not have a middle name, we don't leave this blank. We put N slash A, which stands for not applicable. All right. It's very important. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen applications returning back to the applicant with USAS officer saying, Hey, fill out those blank spaces with not applicable or none. It's very important. You can't leave them black blank. Okay, let's move on further. We got the physical address, obviously, in care of is gonna be John Doe. And then the address, one, two, three, whatever street. Apartment, if there's if there is, if if there isn't, just put none or or not applicable. Honestly, I recommend putting not applicable, just there's no confusion. Uh, Rio, whatever, state, probably does not apply, city, zip code. Postal code, if applicable, province, if applicable, if not, just put not applicable, country, Brazil. But uh, in this case, since John Doe is a refugee, he's already, he's not in Brazil. So his physical address is going to be here. So scratch the Rio is going to be the address here. Let's say he is in uh, New York City, one, one, I guess 500, whatever the zip codes are in New York and uh, New York and all of that you can do on the computer. Most of these, the gray ones that you can do on the computer. Postal code, not applicable, country, USA. Other information. Okay, so alien registration number, A number, um, most of the you know immigrants that have immigration case, whatever kind of immigration case uh, going in process, they have the alien registration number. So you put that here, country of birth, in this example, we're gonna be Brazil. Country of citizenship, still Brazil. Class of admission. Okay, now the class of admission is one, one of those things that I get quite a lot of few uh, questions about. In this case, because our John Doe example came as a refugee, is going to be simply refugee. All right, but what if, let's say John Doe came here and he applied for asylum and now he has the immigration process going, he has the pending asylum case, what is the class of action? 
So class of uh, class of admission, not a class of action. So, so class of admission is based on which grounds did the person enter the United States. So, for example, if John Doe came here, let's say on a student visa, and then he applied for the asylum, the class of admission would be the F1 student. And you can simply put F1, or you can put simply F1 student, or you can put student really does not make that much difference but that is the class of admission how the person got into the country okay moving further mail date of birth social security if any if you don't have a social security yet just put none that's fine now moving further this is the important part obviously really everything is important but this is kind of where you let the immigration officer that is reviewing the application on which grounds you are asking for that travel document application type yes part two so there are a few options i'm going to read them and we're kind of briefly going to talk about all of them number one or 1a i'm a permanent resident or conditional resident of the united states and i am applying for re-entry permit okay that's pretty straightforward i now hold u.s refugee or asylee status and I am applying for a refugee travel document. So in our case, this is what it's going to be because in our example, John Doe, he is a refugee. There is one C, I'm a permanent resident as a direct result of a refugee or asylee status and I'm applying for a refugee travel document. So in one C, our example, John Doe, if he already got the green card based off that asylee refugee status, then that would be the one C. 1D is I am applying for an advanced parole document to allow me to return to the United States after temporary foreign travel. Okay, again, pretty straightforward. I am outside the United States and I'm applying for an advanced parole document. So 1E is if you are already outside of the United States. And 1F is I am applying for an advanced parole document for a person who is outside the United States. So 1F is someone applying on behalf of someone. Okay, so pretty straightforward, but very important to know which one is the right for you, right? <laughs> and to select the right one. And if you selected the box 1F, which is the last one, if you're applying on behalf of somebody, provide the following information about that person. So who you are applying for. In our case, we're not applying for nobody. So in our case, it's going to be not applicable, not applicable, not applicable. But here's one thing that I wanted to point out. As you can see here, I cannot click on any of these windows because they are not gray, they are white. Don't leave them blank regardless. Once you print out the application, which you will still have to print out once you fill it out, because you will need to sign it and send it. Once you print it out, go back to the application where you did not, where you did not have a chance to fill out certain uh, windows, I guess, fields, text fields, <laughs> go through them and manually yourself write none or not applicable, right? Very important. And then the physical address for that person. Again, this is none of this is gonna be applicable for us. So on our application, when we, once we would print it out, we will go back, not applicable, not applicable, not applicable, not applicable. <laughs> I know it sounds a little bit uh, like overdoing, but again, you don't want that application to come back to you because if it does, it's really not a big deal if the application comes back to you because at the end of the day, you can just follow the instructions in that letter from immigration officer who reviewed your case and just send it back and it's going to be fine most, most of the times. But the amount of time that you're wasting is pretty significant because you're filling out the application you're putting it in the mail three four days it's in the mail it gets into the p.o box three four days because before it's taken out of the p.o box three four days before it is reviewed you know three four days hopefully in the best case scenario if it's reviewed in three four days and then it's sent sent you know you send it they send it back then you fix it then you send it back it's just, it's ridiculous. You don't, you don't want to go through it. It's just, it's simply, you know, silly. Why would you want to, so be, better be safe than sorry whenever it comes to stuff like that. Okay, so now we're done with part two. We're moving on to the part three now. Processing information.
Okay, so date of intended departure. Another thing that I get a lot of question, date of what if I don't have the date yet? What if I don't have the tickets yet? What if I'm not gonna be able to find the tickets for a certain planned date? Not a big deal at all. This is just kind of an estimation for the immigration officer to keep in mind. It doesn't really matter what your intended departure date is, as long as you kind of give approximate it's more than enough let's say you're planning to leave you know, right now it's january 27 maybe you're planning to leave somewhere in the middle of may you haven't even researched the tickets yet you you don't know completely fine just put may 15th 2023 and it's just fine same goes for the number two expected length length of trip in days again it's very very specific you, you might be there for two weeks but what if you cannot find the return ticket after two weeks? What if you're going to be there for 20 days? Whatever. If you're planning two weeks, just put 15 days. Good enough. If you're planning to be there for two months, just put 60 days. If you're a little bit less, if you're a little bit over, not a big deal. Approximation is just fine with this. No problems at all. Okay, let's move on to the next one. It's 3A. Are you or any person included in this application now in exclusion, deportation, removal, or session proceedings? Hopefully not. In our case, we're going to put not. But if yes, then you will have to put the name of uh, DHS uh, office. 4A, have you ever been issued a re-entry permit or refugee trial document? If yes, you will have to provide some additional details if you've done that in the past. But probably not because you're watching this video because if you did it in the past then you already know how to do it okay so moving on further we still have the processing information continued let's talk about this information where do you want this travel document sent okay I, i'll explain why there is even this option it sounds kind of weird for now but you'll understand why so we have an option to the u.s address shown in part one that is the physical address that we specified here in in uh, part one right here um, so your address basically um, there's also to US embassy or consulate at okay in this this is going to be the case if let's say you're applying for somebody who is outside of the United States or for example you yourself are outside of the States and you are requesting that re-entry permit and of course you're gonna need that and in order for 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 them to to um, um, kind of send it to you if you don't have an address a permanent address somewhere outside of the United States or you're not sure you can always request it to be sent to the US Embassy at a certain whatever the city whatever the nearest US Embassy there is which is very very convenient so that's for the Embassy information just in case there's also the same option to send it to DHS office overseas there's also an option to the address shown in part two which we're gonna come back to the part two which is going to be right here that's in case if you're applying for somebody so for to their address to their personal address if they have a permanent address and to the address shown in part three that is in case if you want this to be sent to a completely different address that is unrelated pretty much to this application well besides being here in the part three so as you can see uh, this is very very convenient for for all of us USAS they made it very very convenient wherever you are if you have a permanent address if you don't have a permanent address there is a way for you to get that travel document or advance parole very convenient but for our purposes we will select you to the US address shown in part one and all this stuff we're gonna put not applicable yes okay so move on moving on to the part four information about your proposed travel that is another one of those parts that I get a lot of questions about on this channel so let's talk about that a little bit uh, purpose of trip if you need more space continue on a separate sheet of paper now this might sound like very very important it is but at the same time is not okay so purpose of the trip you really don't need to write the whole essay here uh, all you can say is you know I'm visiting my mother-in-law she, she's she's in poor health and I want to check on her make sure that everything is fine I want to be close to her all right or I'm going to pick up my children and, and bring them here to the United States 
or I'm going for a business meeting, or whatever it is. Just a few sentences, very brief, very straightforward, not too much crazy detail, just so it's understandable. The purpose of your trip is understandable. And then 1B is also kind of the same way, list the countries you intend to visit. Again, brief, well, I'm going to, I don't know, Ukraine, All right? You can put the city and, and the country. Uh, and if you are, you know, flying now for transit um, flights, for example, if you're flying to, uh, I don't know, wow. Let's say you're flying to Spain and your flight is through a Turkey, probably a terrible example. But if you are you have a transit flight through Turkey, you don't need to put Turkey here. You just put the Spain because your destination is Spain. You're just flying through Turkey. Okay, because I got a question like that as well. That's why I'm answering. Well, let's move on to the part five now. Hopefully this is clear. No questions for you. Uh, complete only if you are applying for a re-entry permit. Okay, so this is going to be very, very specific, but I'll read through these options just so that we are aware, just in case if it applies to you, you kind of uh, are, are aware of what they're going to expect in the application. Unless you're, of course, filling it out right now as you're watching this video, which probably would be the best most convenient thing to do. Okay, since becoming a permanent resident of the United States or during the past five years, whichever is less, how much total time have you spent outside the United States? Okay, that is only for those who are applying for re-entry permit and pretty straightforward. Whichever applies for you, you put it in there. Since you became a permanent resident of the United States, have you ever filed a federal income tax return as a non-resident or failed to file a federal income tax return because you considered yourself to be a non-resident? If yes, give details on a separate sheet of paper, but your answer really should be no here, okay? But for us, it's not applicable because our John Doe, he's, uh, he's still a refugee, he's not a permanent resident. Okay, moving on to the part six. Complete only if applying for refugee travel document. So this is going to be applicable for John Doe. So let's read through it and see what's uh, going on. Country from which you are a refugee or asylee. So in our example, it is Brazil. And I apologize if you're from Brazil. I'm not from Brazil. So if you're from Brazil and you're like, hey, you there is no refugee programs from Brazil to the United States. This is just an example. Any foreign country. You put it there. Whatever you're refugee from if you answer yes to any of the following questions you must explain on a separate sheet of paper include your name and a number on the top of each sheet do you plan to travel to the country above hopefully no since you were accorded refugee asylee status have you ever returned to the country named above hopefully no applied for and or obtained a national passport, passport renewal or entry permit of that country? Hopefully no. Applied for and or received by benefit from such country? Again, really hopefully no. Since you were accorded refugee asylum status, have you by any legal procedure or voluntarily act requiring the nationality of the country named above? No, I really, really hope no. Acquired a new nationality? No, been granted refugee or asylum status in any other country. Hopefully no. The reason why I say hopefully no is if you have an asylum, and this is probably, it's probably a whole separate video that I need to make, but let me know in the comments below if you want to see that. If you're an asylee or a refugee or you have a pending asylum status, you don't want to do anything with the country from which you ran away from because that's what refugee asylum statuses are it's a protecting it's a protective status for a person who is who was persecuted in the country that they ran away from they ran away from danger to the safety here in the united states of america so obviously you don't want to put do first of all you don't want to do anything with that country and of course you don't want to have any yeses here at all that's why if you do have a yes they expect you 
to have a really, really good explanation on a separate sheet of paper. And this is the kind of explanation where you need to really, really have a good reasons, really good explanation, very serious stuff. And if it is the case, I highly recommend having a consultation with an immigration attorney, highly rec at least immigration practitioner who will kind of guide you filling out that statement because technically, you shouldn't be dealing with that country ever again anything not the passport from them not not nothing at all all right you ran away from that country there was danger of course there are certain circumstances for example you know let's say the government changed and the danger no longer exists okay that's a big reason you'll have to explain that the government structure changed there's a new president there's new parliament whatever now the people like myself are not being persecuted but this is an example but you understand this is very very important okay let's move on to the part seven hopefully i made it clear complete only if applying for advanced parole all right so that's not the case in our example but we will go through it just in case if it is in yours on a separate sheet of paper explain how you qualify for an advanced parole document and what circumstances warrant issuance of advanced parole include copies of any documents you wish considered all right so one we have how many trips do you intend to use this document is it for one trip or is it for multiple trips if the person intended to receive an advanced parole document is outside the United States, provide the location, city or town and country of the U.S. Embassy or Consulate or the DHS Overseas Office that you want us to notify. If the travel document will be delivered to an overseas office, where should the notice to pick up the document be sent? And again, you have an option for to, uh, the address shown in part two, which is to, to that the person that you're applying on behalf of or to the address shown in part seven which is right here you can fill it out again once you print it out if it's not the case for you leave it put it all not applicable all right moving on to the very last part as you can see not so bad what is it only five pages on the application not too shabby part eight signature of the applicant so this is obviously you'll have to print it out and and sign it uh, date of the signature Right, you can fill it out right now. So today, let's let's say we're doing today, 1-27-2023-3, sorry. Daytime phone number, your phone number, right? Uh, or whoever is applying, our John Doe here, 456-7890, and I'm sorry if this is your real phone number, no intention there. Information about person who prepared this application, most of the times it's gonna be you yourself, so all of this is going to be not applicable, but, I'm gonna put it not applicable but if somebody did prepare it for you there you go preparers full name preparers mailing address in our case all of this not applicable and preparers contact information again everything is not applicable and this one is very I know it sounds kind of silly but this is very important to leave all this stuff not applicable and while I'm doing this just so that I make myself as clear as possible with this just so that you don't waste your time. Here's why you want to do, here, here's why immigration officers want, want you to do that, right? Because let's say you done, right? You, you done your application, everything good. You sent it out, something happens in the mail, it gets delivered to somebody else. They open up the application, there's blank fields, they fill out their own information in the blank fields. Or for example, here they cross out this option and put this option right here just just cross it out with the paper and fill out their own address you see how just something so little so silly it might actually create some serious damage to an individual who, who really needs this so that's why immigration does not want you to leave any blank spaces okay so we're done with the application we printed it out we filled out, not applicable, we signed it, we're good, we have the application. Let's come back to the page here. We're almost done with the video, so stick around for just a little bit more. I'm gonna show you where to file and uh, the filing fee. Filing fees is, is, is pretty straightforward. Once you, whichever one applies for you, you're just writing out a check. Uh, and the check, you can find in the instructions where the check should be addressed. 
very easy. Um, I'm gonna show you how to find some kind of information. For example, we're looking for, okay, who do I address the check to? Okay, great question. If you read through it, it will take some time, but on your computer, if you have a PDF document open like this in front of you, you can press Control F and then check. Now let's see, check. Nope, not this, check. Check a box, nope, check a box, check a box. Aha, uh -huh. use the following guidelines when you prepare your checks or money orders. All right, we're getting there. So the check or money order must be drawn on a bank or other financial institution located in the United States and must be payable payable in U.S. currency. Okay, makes sense. Make the checks or money orders payable to U.S. Homeland, uh, I'm sorry, U.S. Department of Homeland Security. All right, so we got our answer. So control F and it allows you to search for any word or any phrase um, in within this um, PDF document. Kind of not related to immigration, but it makes it easier for you to navigate. Okay, so we know how to address the check. You know how much to pay from here. You can find that information. Let's uh, find out where to file and then that's it. We'll uh, let you go from this video. So. Direct filing addresses for Form I-131, Application for Travel Document. As you can see, there's quite a few options uh, right here. Uh, quite a few options, depending on who you are, what you're applying for, what kind of status you have. So we're gonna stick to our John Doe, who is a refugee from Brazil. So let's see if we can, he needs a refugee travel document. We already know that. So we have abuse spouses, applicants with spending Form I-485, which is the application for uh, um, registered permanent residence for a green card, Haitian family member, Cuban family member, CNMI consideration for deferred action of childhood arouse, this for DACA, uh, relative, well, DACA, but they call it DACA, relatives of uh, Filip Filipino war veteran, humanitarian parole applicants, T or U visa holders, refugee travel document applications. All right, so this is uh, for our guy, John Doe. So let's click on this. And there you go, if you are currently inside United States, that's that's going to be our John Doe. But there's also an option to cur if you're currently outside the United States. And here, here's the address. The address is right here. Whether you're sending with USPS, FedEx, or UPS, this is where you're sending to. You're sending it to USCIS Refugee and International Operations. Here's the address. But our John Doe is in the United States, so let's find out. You should apply for a refugee travel document and appear for any required biometric service appointment before you leave the United States. Makes sense. Go to USCIS Logbox Filing Locations chart for certain employment-based forms. All right, so let's click on that. We're going further now, further into the website. There we go. We specify the eligibility categories that use these addresses on the following pages. And that's one of us, yes, I-131, so there you go. Let's see, if you are filing certain employment-based forms, I-360, I-485, I-765, or I-131, which is us, our John Doe in this case, and you live in Arizona, California, Minnesota, Oregon, Pennsylvania, not the case, because our guy lives in New York. New York, New Jersey, okay, so this is for us, so. This is going to be the address right here, but there are two options. Which one should we send it with? There's a US Postal Service, USPS, which goes to PO Box. And there's also the Courier Service special address, FedEx, UPS, and DHL. Now, most of the attorneys that I've personally worked with, they all prefer to send it with couriers, FedEx, UPS, DHL, because it's, it's, faster maybe more expensive but personally if i always send everything and whoever hundreds of cases that i dealt with were sent through usps and there wasn't ever any single issue you see u.s postal service is u.s postal service government postal service basically right it's not directly necessarily government itself, maybe, but I'm not sure the structure, but. So I would probably recommend you sending just because my old habit, just because I've personally done that and everyone I know personally done that. 
US Postal Service to the PO box. Maybe it takes longer, but just there's just something about US Postal Service that for whatever reason. But, but there's nothing if you want to send it with FedEx or UPS or DHL, just make sure to send it to this address and not PO box. Very, very important. But that's it for every um, uh, state that is out here. There is a separate, not for every state, but for certain states, there is a separate address that you need to send it to. Once you send the application, it takes about, I would say between two weeks and one and a half month for you to receive the response from USAS. Hopefully it's a, a notice of receipt, basically saying that, hey, we received your application, everything is good, it's being processed, and then typically, tip, Typically, I-131 uh, applications for travel documents, they take about a month, two months for to get your actual document. I've seen cases where it takes a little bit longer, three, four months, depending on the state, depending on where you're filing, depending on how you're filing. But most of the times, it's, it's about month, month and a half, maybe two months. Uh, but again, I've done a video on checking the status of your case. If you have the receipt notice, you have the receipt number, you can check the case and see, track exactly at which stage of the application, uh, of the review your application is. So hopefully this video helped you figure out everything you need to know about filling out the I-131. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below. Uh, don't forget to subscribe because I do every week. I answer, I go through all of your comments I, and, I, and I make the video answering uh, your question. As always, thank you for watching. God bless and uh, I'll see you in the next video.